From Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over three decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. Thank you for joining the McLaughlin Group, a show where friends disagree agreeably. I'm your host, Tom Rogan. This week's panelists are author and columnist Pat Buchanan, mm -hmm. columnist Eleanor Clift of the Daily Beast, columnist Clarence Page of the Chicago Tribune, and my colleague at the Washington Examiner, Madeleine Fry. Okay, let's get to issue one, election 2019. Democrat Andy Beshear won the Kentucky governorship on Tuesday, dethroning Republican incumbent Matt Bevin. While Republicans sweep the decks in other Kentucky races, Bevin's loss after campaigning from President Trump is embarrassing for the GOP. Democrats also seized control of both chambers of the Virginia legislature and scored wins in nominally Republican areas of Pennsylvania. But it wasn't all bad for the GOP. The party made inroads in New Jersey and regained control of the Mississippi governorship. Pat, what's the top line takeaway from these results? Uh, from Tuesday, I think the Democratic tide continues to rise and they took over the state of Virginia, which has turned blue. But listen, this week, the real story is there's an outbreak of panic among the billionaire boys club in the Democratic Party over the prospect that Elizabeth Warren could win this and Joe Biden can't handle it. You got Jamie Dimon has been speaking out about Warren's plans and against him. You got Bill Gates. You got David Rubenstein of the Carlisle Group. You got Bloomberg, Mayor Bloomberg, mm -hmm. the multi-billionaire is going to get in and in, you know, uh, income inequality. You better hide your guns. <laughs> wealth, wealth inequality is a real problem. Bloomberg is the guy to deal with it with 50 billion. But what this portends for me is really, the Democratic Party is in something of a crisis now over the fear that Elizabeth Warren can win. She could win Iowa, win New Hampshire, and win the nomination. And they can't tolerate her because they don't believe she can beat Trump. And Trump is beating her right now in these battleground states, four out of six, and one is tied. So with that going on, I think that's the big story now, is the turmoil inside the Democratic Party with the wealthy and the elites really unaccepting what's, uh, what's going to happen. Okay, Eleanor. Well, mm -hmm. I agree that Democrats are nervous. It's not just the wealthy and the elites. Democrats, Democrats want to <laughs> win. Democrats want to <laughs> win. And that poll that the New York Times and Siena College did a week ago indicates that in the battleground states that are going to decide the election that the president is still quite competitive and Elizabeth Warren does worse in a head-to-head -head matchup against uh, Trump than anybody else. Uh, Biden wins for those states but not by a lot and he ties in uh, Michigan and loses North Carolina. So there's nervousness but I don't want to just let Tuesday go by. <laughs> uh, Virginia, the big Democratic turnout, it's a state that was once reliably red, is now reliably blue, and Pat lives there, mm -hmm. and now he is he is just in the middle of all of us. He has to go searching for the old Confederacy I'm gonna, now. I'm gonna <laughs> it's I'm really hard. South, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, Kentucky defeating uh, Governor Bevins uh, is, is a feat, yep. but I don't read a whole lot into that for 2020. Okay. Bevins was singularly unpopular, mm -hmm. and he went after teacher pensions, and he accused teachers who'd gone on a walkout of contributing to child molestation because they had left children at home and they couldn't go to school. It was totally bizarre behavior. And so he lost, but every other Republican in the state uh, won. But still, it's nice to have a Democrat in that chair when redistricting comes around in 2020. So all of these wins are, are important. And, and uh, Mayor Bloomberg, Let's see if he okay. if he has the stomach to fight it out right. in the Democratic <laughs> primaries maybe, with all those progressives. <laughs> maybe we'll get on to Bloomberg and Madly, uh, Madeline, what, what is your uh, takeaway? So I think it's difficult for the Democratic Party that there isn't a clear front runner at this point. There's Joe Biden, there's Elizabeth Warren. It's kind of hard to see which one is going to end up on top. Um, and the fact that um, Bloomberg has just jumped, is considering jumping into the race, um, I think is maybe it says more about him than about the Democratic right. primary, but the fact that he actually thinks this is the time to maybe jump in is a little bit a little bit odd, I think, this late in the game. And perhaps he doesn't want, I mean, one of the interesting issues here, Clarence, with the, the billionaire, you know, whatever frame you want to put on that is with Elizabeth Warren's plan, mm -hmm. their billions would evaporate over a period of years. 
Well, I don't know if it totally evaporated. I think they might, must, might have some small change left behind. <laughs> uh, frankly, there's a lot of panic, though, on Wall Street about Elizabeth Warren winning uh, because uh, a lot of their, their uh, gravy days would be over. But I think we're jumping the gun a little bit. Number one, no votes have been cast right. yet, as I'm always reminding people. And where were we four years ago at this point? I mean, Donald Trump was a latecomer as well, and he wasn't viewed as a front runner. Uh, he was by, down in the polls Republican right up to election day. Yeah. Yeah, right, right up there, exactly. Uh, it's uh, so. Uh, I think what we are seeing, though, is a real debate going on in the, uh, among Democrats, which they need, uh, because yeah. uh, the question is, in the, uh, will they sacrifice their uh, long-term gains for short-term victories? I saw that happen in 1972. A lot of other people don't want to see that happen again. Mm -hmm. But it's really, there's no doubt about it. The fact that more Eric Holder's considering it, you hear other names considering it. Hillary Bloomberg, Clinton. Hillary Clinton. Well, Those are votes of no confidence in the field that's out there. They're saying this crowd can't handle it necessarily. But let me just say about Bloomberg, look, he's a capable mayor of New York, everybody agrees. But if he should get the nomination, what would it say that a billionaire can buy the nomination of the Democratic Party and that if he only had 50 million instead of 50 billion, nobody would be thinking of it. Uh, you, you saw he has, he, one, he, what he, he's he, saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He hasn't, yeah. he hasn't bought it yet and I don't think he's gonna be able to. He has looked at running for president every four years for the last 20 years yeah. probably and it, it was always third party and he realizes that that would really just hand the re-election to Trump. So now if he wants to get into the Democratic primary, fine, but he's going to have to get out in those living rooms in Iowa. He's going <laughs> to have to campaign. Uh, he can't just mail it in. And so I think he's going to look at this and probably back away. By the way, uh, young Democrats have made OK Bloomer uh, go viral on Twitter uh, right. already. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'll give you good. a translation later, uh, Pat. But <laughs> my son had explained <laughs> to me what that means. OK Bloomberg, the young people are going for the billionaires. What? No, no, Tell no, us no. about the Actually, millennials, Tom. No, are they uh, selling I'll, out? <laughs> No, I'll, no. I'll have to explain it to you. Maybe Tom can explain it to you. No. Well, oh, no, okay, okay, okay is not a vote of All confidence. Right, well, let's, we'll say yeah, it's not <laughs> a vote of confidence. We'll that that way. <laughs> Maddie, one of the things we saw from this election, though, was the loss uh, of voting margins for the Republicans in suburban areas, affluent, that you would traditionally expect to be quite strong areas. I mean, mm -hmm. how much do you think uh, President Trump and the GOP, as they move into 2020, will try and confront that issue, or... Will they simply double down on the Trump base, which at least seems to be the president's strategy at the moment? Yeah, it seems to me that he is more doubling down on the base. I think he's recently been appealing to evangelical voters, his personal pastor he brought on to the administration. I don't see him as much appealing to the people who have not already, you know, been interested in him before. I don't think that anyone is going to change their mind at right. this point. But if he finds you know, the same the, people. The other poll that unsettled uh, Democrats a week ago was a New York Times, uh, no, Wall Street, Wall Street Journal, NBC poll that had Trump at 45 percent. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed in three years. He won with 46.1 percent, and his base remains stable. And so you got to look at those battleground states. And in Virginia, what turned the tide was when the governor called a special session and the Republicans ended mm -hmm. after 90 minutes because it was to discuss gun violence and gun mm -hmm. safety. And that issue used to work against Democrats all the time. It helped them win Virginia. You know, let's take uh, Fairfax County. Yep. Look, there's many, many immigrants in there, third world countries, who've come into there, they're moving into the schools, they want schools and roads and all the rest of it. Demography is destiny in the long run. And there's no question about it, the long run trends ever since the Nixon-Reagan era and 49 state victories have been people moving away from the Republican Party. We used to carry California was a given. You'd right. sweep California. Nixon carried it six times. Reagan carried it four times. You couldn't carry so it. Are you, so you Pat, are you endorsing the Republican right. Party, uh, the Republican Party evolving then? And no, the trying point to is, no, I mean, I, my believers is this, you've got a certain time, and those of us of our, a certain age, and your time and the way, these old, those old ways of winning, I don't think can last more than one or two more elections. So this is the white flag of surrender. No, it's not. I mean, I think you uh, you go into the resistance, isn't that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very well said. There, there you go. The, the, the Fairfax and it all, by the way, also education levels of the residents are going up as well. The immigrants are coming from such uh, far away places as Ohio, Illinois, New Jersey. I and mean, go to, uh, go to work for America. government. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. Cla Clarence, is there an issue though that that President Trump, as Eleanor observes? You know, his base is quite stable. 
-hmm. that mm -hmm. people, whatever they think of him, as Maddie suggests, have made up their mind generally. Right. Would you say there is a risk then for Democrats that, you know, Joe Biden pretty well understood, but if President Trump has a level of stability, all he really needs to do is undercut the support base of those Democrats who are less well known and Americans might not like how Trump presents them. Is that an issue? Well, you know, the, uh, b both parties, we, we can see their bases are solid. Uh, we, we got, a, what, about 15% really swing voters we're talking about mm -hmm. uh, that are, 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 are been campaigned for and in those five key states. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there are a lot of people, Democrats, ha haven't even made much of an outreach for. Uh, Joe Biden, for example, does very well among black voters. Uh, he's yeah. he's viewed as being ahead in South Carolina. I haven't seen that much of an effective um, campaign by the, by others for those voters. And yeah. that's, that's just one group. Which decisive an election, let's say both parties got 45 percent. In the 10 percent you need to get that's wide open, you need 6 percent. The way to get that is the way Trump's got his base going for him. They're going to have to take down the Democratic candidate and make the Democratic candidate unacceptable or intolerable. And that's the problem Democrats well, see with Warren. Right. Well, Dave, I think it can be done. Dave Wasserman, who is with the Cook Political yep. Report, says you could run a tree stump against Donald Trump, and the tree stump would win. The problem is the Democrats have to come up with a human being right. that, that's better that, than the tree stump. Who, who, right. who, who will be who, who will have flaws because everyone has flaws, and that the Trump campaign has the money and the. Uh, the shame to, 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 to do character assassination let, on a big time scale. Let, let's sort of cap this off with, and we'll, we'll start with Pat, but who do you at this point think will be the Democratic nominee? If I had to put money on it, I would say it's 50% that it's Warren. I would say, I think Biden, as I've said before, I don't think he's going to make it. Uh, but I still would say he's got probably 20, 25%. I think Buttigieg is a possibility. Okay. I don't see Bernie moving ahead of Warren. Okay, Eleanor. Uh, the party is having a healthy debate about how do you win? Do you go the safer route? Do you go the bold progressive route mm -hmm. and count on all of these mm -hmm. new voters to come out? I'm afraid the new voter theory doesn't work because the Republicans are going to be very uh, engaged and excited because their guy is getting mm -hmm. impeached. So, I mean, I think the safe route works. I think Joe Biden uh, still has, uh, it's, he's still the best bet okay. for the Democrats but to do, win. But do you worry about Warren? I don't think Warren can win in those six battleground okay. states. Okay, mm -hmm. Maddie. I think the Democrats are gonna want more of a centrist like Joe Biden, and I would have said him a few weeks ago, but I think now it might be Elizabeth Warren. Okay. Current. Yeah, I th I, I, I'm still hanging in there with Joe yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. as far as, as far as the <laughs> odds go. Uh, his base is more reliable. They turn they turn out more. Uh, 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 although young Democrats are, are turning out more reliably now too, mm -hmm. so, so that, that, that's a question mark. If Joe doesn't, if Joe shows real weakness, I I put Buttigieg ahead of of uh, Bloomberg uh, for being uh, his likely replacement in in that lane. So we'll oh. see what happens. Okay, Pat is the uh, is the mm -hmm. The, the, the fervent supporter of President Trump here. I'm going to give you the concluding comment. What should we expect from the White House as the open hearings on impeachment start next week? I think you're going to have the, the open hearings will be more contentious up on the Hill. It's going to be, I think, televised starting on Wednesday. I think it's going to be a battle. And I think because the I mean, shift guys have had it all their way for a couple of weeks now, I think it's going to be more evenly matched. And a lot of people are going to say, wait a minute, do we really want to, it's, you know, he shouldn't have done this, but it's not impeachable. Do we want to overthrow the government or do we want to go to the election? Do you think President Trump will turn up to any of those hearings in the audience? No, I think he'll be tweeting about them though. <laughs> okay, he might be tweeting about it. Right, before we go to this issue, I just have to tell you, the first clip you're about to see is from last week, and you'll understand why, but I'll go to it now. Issue two, Mexican mayhem. What is going to be the biggest story for good or ill in foreign policy, the biggest country, if you want, in 2020? Pat? In 2020, I think Mexico. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Elena? Uh, immigration, because it dovetails with domestic policy. Good I point. agree with that. I got, I, I got to go with Mexico, too. And the panel last week identified Mexico as the big foreign policy story to watch in 2020. Their prediction was apt. After all, on Monday, three women and six children, all U.S.-Mexican dual citizens, were gunned down as they drove to a wedding in Mexico. The brutal attack is believed to have been carried out by a Mexican drug cartel. 
President Trump is now calling on Mexico to wage war on the cartels. Eleanor, is President Trump right? Is uh, President Lopez Obrador's hugs not bullets policy uh, a failure now? Um, the problem with the Mexican cartels is not a new story. It goes back several presidents. And uh, what happened in Mexico is, is truly horrific. But I think the Mexican president is on the right track offering uh, scholarships, enabling kids to go to school so they don't join gangs, and making more jobs available. It's not enough. And what happened recently with El Chapo's son, who is now following in his father's footsteps, uh, he was in a shootout with the uh, local enforcement, and the gang won, and he escaped. And that was a real signal that the uh, government is not up to it. Now, when the president offers help, I don't know exactly what he has in mind, and I don't see Mexico inviting a U.S. military presence. Conceivably, the FBI could go in there, and specifically uh, with the case with the Mormon mm -hmm. uh, villagers who were brutally uh, murdered. Uh, but I, I don't quite see what, what U.S. involvement uh, can be. It's, it's a horrible, ongoing story about the control. And, and we bear some responsibility in the sense that we are the consumers we'll get onto that of the drugs. Yeah. Pat. Um, Eleanor makes the point, and I think it's legitimate, this was an awful atrocity against Mormon fundamentalists, a family, innocent people. But far more, I think, that pro what projects into the future is, is that the cartel went into that town, I think it's CNO, uh, that cartel, they went in and they defeated the local police and the National Guard who surrendered, went into the jail and turned El Chapo's son over to the cartel. I mean, this is like early Vietnam with the Viet Cong taking over a, you mm -hmm. know, a village or a town and then withdrawing. I think in the longer, I think we can help out with intelligence and things like that. You don't want the Delta Force or 82nd Airborne dropping yeah. into Mexico. But I'll tell you, as you look down the road, I don't see how you solve the problems we got there with drugs coming on, trafficking of humans, wide and open we borders. S we, s we solved it in Colombia. Yeah. Took a generation, but we did. Mm -hmm. You did, but we had people down there working with them, CIA, and battling yeah. with them. Yeah. yeah, but that was a, that was a war. Yeah. If you want something like that going on in Mexico, that's what you may get. Right, well, Clarence. Yeah, it, the, 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 it was a war. Mexico, this problem has been going on a long time. And drugs are the biggest industry they've got in Mexico, by far. I mean, it's, uh, and, and it's incredible how much better armed the, the uh, cartels are than the uh, authorized army and police. Uh, and and uh, President Trump says he, uh, he wants to, to wage war. He's always great at talking tough. Mm -hmm. But uh, frankly, we, we saw what happened the last time they waged mm -hmm. war down there in Mexico. They removed uh, some cartel leaders and they were all replaced by new leaders and more mayhem and more more violence because there were these turf battles that went on. Mm -hmm. You've got to really study that problem down there at, at different levels. It's extremely complicated. And I, I don't know if we're going to see that kind of turnaround like we got in Colombia. Like I say, it took a long time there. Maddie, how, how do you see this? I mean, do you think there is a political appetite for a more robust military presence, the CIA running around down there? I mean, or do you think, to Pat's point, that actually this is a kind of situation we're just going to have to learn to live with? One of the interesting things to note about this story is the way that it was portrayed in the media. Um, AP, the New York Times almost framed it, it, framed, it, framed it as if it was the family's fault or that the, you know, the victims were, you know, because they were Mormon, there was something, mm -hmm. you know, blamable on their end. Um, and this specific instance was just an attack on an innocent group of people. Um, and I think that the way that people talk about that in the story and what's being and in, what's involved in it is going to shape public perception on what's mm -hmm. necessary in that situation. Mm -hmm. Well, this Mormon outpost was kind of caught between two rival gangs on a, on a, on a, a stretch of of territory that the gangs used to transport mm -hmm. their their goods, and they were traveling in these big SUVs. And so uh, there is a, a school of thought that thinks it was a case of mistaken identity. I think the families themselves feel that, like they were targeted because they have been under a, a pressure. They are doing very well. They live in nice homes, and there's been some, some tension. But, um, you know, I. It, to me, it looks like a, like a terrible case of mistaken you know, identity. This will, this, I mean, given the horrific atrocity and the fact that they were Americans in exile, if you will, 
This will focus, and Trump will focus, on the border issues very much in the fall. Sanctuary cities, open borders, abolish ICE, you know, give health care for illegal aliens, and all the rest of these issues. And he will make that issue, I think, because, and this dramatizes it dramatically, as does that, uh, that battle in Mexico. He can say just what we were talking about last week. That the real problem in the future of this country isn't on the DMZ in Korea. Yeah. It's on the border of the United States wow. and Mexico. They say, they say in politics you should, should never watch how sausage is being made. I just watched it. <laughs> how how, right. how yeah. Trump is going to take this example in Mexico and transplant it to this country and make it seem like everybody and, and, needs to worry. And by the way, building a wall isn't right. going to solve it. And building it, a wall is not going to solve it. All right. Right. There's open borders. Okay. Right? I mean, but Pat, Pat, the opposite of wall is not open borders. I mean, yeah. there, there's many, many uh, other alternatives that will right. work better. Madeline, right. do you think there's some responsibility? Our generation, um, you know, ultimately this violence is happening in Mexico where thousands of people are being killed each year, most of them innocent, uh, because of young Americans, but Americans generally, consuming uh, illegal narcotics and providing a profit incentive for extreme violence. I mean, do you think there's some... You know, quite frankly, if we want to see the, you know, the cartels are the end result of this, and, mm -hmm. you know, truly evil, but Americans ourselves are to blame to some degree. Yeah, I don't think anyone wants to take responsibility and say, oh, me doing drugs is resulting in people dying in Mexico. Right. But you can't ignore the fact that there is that exchange going on and there are, um, there are problems that arise and it's, you know, something that we need to talk about. It's not just, you know. We're, we actually do influence what's going no. on the south 1920s, of the border. The 1920s, Tom, the 1920s, mm -hmm. all those shootings and Tommy guns yep. and Al Capone and all the rest of it. Up in Clarence's Because of prohibition. Yes. They outlawed booze and the beer and wine, and people felt it was legitimate to have it and enjoy it. Well, and then so it was provided by the American cartels, the mafia, and all these gangs. So you're in favor of legalization? Well, well, I was I was against prohibition in those days. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, we're 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 legalizing marijuana yeah. at a pretty rapid yeah. rate in this country. Mm -hmm. But the drugs that are coming across are are on a, a, a different but, you level. Know, yeah. I really am. Listen, uh, this is where I'm no libertarian here. Idea of D.C. you know legalizing marijuana with kids having all these troubles in schools and things. The fentanyl comes in and kills people. I had you know kids I grew up with that died downtown with heroin addiction and stuff. I mean, drugs are far worse than alcohol, yep. and alcohol is well, itself addictive. And also legalizing marijuana will enable us to spend more time and money fighting fentanyl. But you're absolutely right about but that being a much more serious problem. Mm -hmm. So let's go around here. In favor of legalizing cocaine, prospectively, yes or no? Consid cocaine? Yes, no, or cons consider? I would consider it under the basis of um, it being able to be safer for people to actually have consequences that people aren't the theory that it could minimize drug violence yeah i would consider it okay Pat. uh i would keep it illegal but i wouldn't incarcerate people for simple use yeah of that but i think you want what to about keep low it. level supply no, I'm not for supply. No, I'm saying, but you put them in prison <laughs> no, still. No, imprisoning <laughs> people no, for low level. Sell, if you buy and sell that, you should go, I think, be your felon. Yeah. I wasn't inviting you to be a drug dealer, don't worry. <laughs> I'm not aware of any move to make cocaine legal, but I, I would say that the governor of Oklahoma uh, this week did a very wonderful thing. He commuted the sentences of over 400 women from a women's pr prison. They were all there in these long sentences for this very low level... Pr uh, possession or or abuse. I mean, they basically need uh, medical treatment. <laughs> they need they need jobs. Mm -hmm. And he went went in there, and they provided driver's licenses and uh, ID cards for them, so they can re-enter yeah. society. Uh, Republican governor. Okay, <laughs> and it's a good way to save money too. Oklahoma needs right. to save twelve million okay. dollars. What's your, what's, what's he your said. Consider, you yes, talking about uh, legalizing hard drugs or marijuana? Yeah, hard drugs. I mean, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, David Simon and and the Wire. The, yeah. Everybody there petitioned the government saying we should legalize cocaine, okay. heroin, because the drug war is a farce. So and, something to and, consider. And, and that, that was the theme of that whole program. But I haven't seen much movement toward it because, like Bill Raspberry said years ago, it's hard to visualize right. what legalized cocaine, legalized heroin would be okay. like. I want to take a slightly different uh, approach than my fellow panelists. I think we are not going to send in the 82nd Airborne, uh, but some of El Chapo's son and some of these others in the Juarez cartel doing this, um, mm -hmm. I think should be introduced to some uh, Predator drones, so with Hellfire missiles. Uh, that kind of, yeah, I mean it. All right. It was a good discussion. 
And now we are going to move on to our favorite bit, predictions. Pat. I think the, uh, the Republicans are going to do well in the open hearings. And some Democrats who are in the House and voted for the hearings are going to be reluctant to invoke, vote for full impeachment. Eleanor. I think the hearings are going to tr try to define a quid pro quo, not in just this fancy Latin phrase, but as bribery, which is in the Constitution as yeah. a crime, and also extortion. Okay. And Madeline, what's your prediction? I'm going to pivot a little bit. I okay. think it's a little early to be talking about 2024, but I think in the next few months we're going to be hearing a lot more about Kanye West, who just released a new album that was mm -hmm. very popular with evangelicals mm -hmm. and has talked about explicitly saying that he wants to run okay. in 24, 2024 and has endorsed Trump. Very good. President Trump's uh, campaign uh, is uh, launching a big support, a big push for black voters uh, yep. uh, this week and this, and this week. Uh, I think that he's not going to really get any bigger of a percentage than he did last time, although he did, okay. he did get a bigger percentage than John McCain. In lieu of a prediction, I want to, you to Google Tom Rogan, Oil Syria, read about it. There is a plan in a humanitarian way to extract that oil. It's not about imperialism and it's important, it could help people help us. Thank you for watching, see you next time.